uh, today I'll be talking how we can search for a lot of different languages on your mobile phone uh, very efficiently. And uh, I think I was just introduced, uh, but to reiterate again, I was from NUSCS 2018, so my junior batch just uh, graduated. I'm currently an iOS engineer in labs, and you can reach me at this email address. So uh, without much further ado, I will talk about uh, what are the things that I will go through today. So three uh, very quick things. Uh, I will introduce to, uh, you to the full text search in SQLite, which is a very powerful uh, tool. And after that, we will go on to try to build our own advanced text search engine, like going beyond what uh, the scope of conventional search engines will do. And finally, at the end, uh, I will give you some uh, tips and tricks in engineering uh, search uh, user experiences. So the first question might come to you is that why do we want to search on mobile devices, right? So uh, increasingly, security and privacy is becoming a larger problem nowadays. A lot of messaging apps now are having end-to-end -end encryption, and a lot of people prefer whatever they store to be on the device themselves. And also, it will allow you to do whatever functions you have when the user is offline. Or just because it's offline, you can get much faster results than if it were to be online. And also, just because we can. You know, nowadays, our phones are so much more powerful. The iPhone 11 was just released, and the new A13 chip is very, very powerful. So, uh, and uh, with this, I'm working on this product in C called CTalk, and it's a messaging app. And so that's why all of these things come into question into our product. Yeah. Uh, just a small disclaimer. So most of the results I presented today will be like results from my own research, my own first-hand research. And of course, it will not be the best way of doing things. If you have better way, feel free to reach out to me or suggest in the Q and A. And uh, most of the ideas I present in this slide will be uh, universal. But I'm using uh, Apple's standard library to give you some examples because they are very complete and it's very useful for you to build mobile applications. But of course, all these things are generalizable to Android because in C, we also have Android team and web team. So all these features that I will be talking about today is, has already been implemented with our, iOS, our Android team and our web team. Yeah. OK, so let's go straight into SQLite. And, um, I know that in, in NOS, people don't really talk about SQL a lot. If you only uh, do like the very uh, basic SQL module, this is what all they teach you inside the module. Basically, just uh, do a SQL query, select from this table uh, with a light query on, uh, with the uh, uh, percentage match on both ends, which will allow you to search for everything that matches this particular query. But this is very, very slow and inflexible. So starting from version 3.24, uh, SQLite actually has this feature called uh, full text search. And the latest version is uh, FTS 5. So uh, what is full text search? So full text search, as the name implies, is allow allows you to search for a piece of text in a large document. And uh, a lot of features come out of the box in SQLite F FTS 5. There is full text search, of course. There are custom tokenizers to handle different language. What tokenizers are, I will talk about later on. And it has a very simple syntax. So let's say if you want to create a table that has FTS5 by default, you can just call this very simple create uh, command called create virtual table message using FTS5. And you can specify your custom tokenizer down there. Um, and the searching for the text syntax is also very simple. You can just select from message where content match. And uh, as you can see down here, this is um, the asterisk, means that this search for a prefix of full. So everything that starts with full will be returned as a result. And there are many, many other kind of syntax that like you can search for uh, prefix, you can search for plus, like both of these has to appear in the same or they're near each other, like a near query. So it's very, very powerful, or and or not. Yeah, so uh, the FTS5 syntax is really, really, really powerful. And there are a lot of other nice things that come out of the box as well. For example, uh, they come with a suite of default tokenizers. So what are tokenizers? Tokenizers are just uh, functions that process your text and turn them into searchable entities. So uh, for example, FTS5 comes with SC Porter and Unicode 6.1. 6 .1. So uh, for ASCII, basically, it's very simple. You just convert everything to ASCII. Like let's say in French or in some other languages, they have like those funny signs on top. It will already be removed. 
or uh, for Potter, uh, they will try to stem. So some of you who have done like uh, information retrieval or like some machine learning algorithm, you might know Potter stammer. So let's say uh, convenience can match convenience or inconvenience, or it's just a stemming of the word. And Unicode, of course, is to handle a lot of, of other languages out there. Um, yeah. And there are some other utility functions, like for example, highlight. You can select highlight where content match this thing. And on top of the results that is returned to you, it also surround the search result with whatever things you specify in the query. So let's say I put in like an XML tag of HL for highlight, and then the results that return to me will contain all of the match queries surrounded by the text. So it's very, very, very useful. However, uh, today uh, is, is not a sermon about uh, FTS5. So we will just um, talk about its benefits and also trade-offs. So what are problems with FTS5? So uh, first thing first, so I'm an iOS developer, and the default SQLite version that's shipped with uh, iOS is, does not su support FTS5. So we need to add a custom version on top of that. And the other problem is that the only data type that is allowed is text. So if you go back to a few slides here, uh, in the create virtual table, if you see, if you know the SQL syntax, usually we have to specify what is a data type, like an integer or a string. But over here, we are not allowed to specify anything. Why? Because the only supported uh, data type is text. So sometimes if you want to sort by timestamp or sort by some other arbitrary ranking, it can be very, very difficult to do so. And uh, other language, for example, let's say the default Unicode 61 tokenizer, uh, surprisingly, that does not support uh, Chinese or Japanese because most of the, these things, they are, let's say here I have uh, Ni Hao Shi Jie. And then if I search for Shi Jie, it actually doesn't give me uh, anything down here, no match found. But if I search for Ni Hao, it actually gives me the result. Why? Because it actually searched for the prefix over here. And because there's no space between these Chinese characters, so it recognizes it's this thing as one entire word. Yeah. So that's why it doesn't work. Uh, and for Vietnamese as well, like Sin Chao Teza, like there are some characters that, uh, for example, this one, when it translates this one, it will not uh, match this one because uh, the E with the, the, the cap on top does not match with this E. But however, in Vietnamese, we usually consider these two as usual when we try to, uh, as similar when we try to search for these things. So it is not very um, powerful. Yeah, so here are the challenges that we face in having FTS5. But it doesn't stop us there. There are a lot of cool things that we can do on top of FTS5. But before I talk about how we address the challenges, let's, let's go into tokenizing a little bit more. So, okay, what is tokenizing? I only went through briefly, but tokenizing, let's say, uh, how many tokens are there in this text? Can anyone tell me? In this particular text, how many tokens are there? Nine or ten. So, yes, it's nine. So each one of this one is a token. How about uh, this one? It's actually eight. Because the my token in the is token is repeated twice. So each of this one will regard them as similar. Yeah, because when we tokenize this string, we only mark what are the tokens that are present in this world and then where they are. So so how do we split this thing into tokens? Do we simply do this? You know, you just split by a regular expression of string. So uh, as all things go, it's not so simple. Uh, so let's dig deeper into the problem. So what is a string? Right. Has anyone been taught in school what a string is? Can anyone tell me what a string is? Actually, that's a smart answer. Yeah. Um, but because the, the real answer is that depends on which programming language or framework we are talking about, they have a very different set of definitions about string. So let's, let's take a look at this string, OK? So what's the length of this string over here? <laughs> Uh, and if you ask a lot of different language, they will give you, each of them will give you a different uh, answer. So let me just fire up a very simple demo over here. Wait, this one is, sorry. And then I need to drag this thing over. Okay, cool. This is too dark. Anyway, I just, uh, so let's just ask node, okay? So uh, let's just open node and we paste uh, 
I'll just uh, go back to my slides and copy that. Sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, I increase the font size when I go back to the terminal. Whoops. Mm, sorry, guys. I'm trying to search for the text. Okay. Let's increase the font size a little bit. Is it big enough for everyone? Okay, let's try this one. Okay, when the moment I paste into the terminal, you see something fishy going on. So if I ask what is the length of this string, it will tell me 17. Yeah, for this string. And I wrote a very simple C program, uh, string length dot C. That just print out this thing. Now the terminal is also screwed up. Yeah. So very simple program, right? De declare a string, print the length, and then I just uh, execute it, string length. Yeah, it returned me 31. Yeah, so uh, very funny. Uh, let's, let's look at Java, OK? Uh, let, let's look at Java, string length. OK, 17, same as uh, our friend uh, Dot. So final thing is, is Swift. So what does Swift say? So I just increase here font size a bit. And Swift says 7, yeah, which is the correct answer if you look at it from a human perspective. There are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 characters in this token. So let's go back to our slides. Yeah. So each of these language will give us a very, very different answer for each of this one. And uh, for us, uh, just nice, Swift gives us the correct answer. And I will use based on this thing uh, for the rest of this talk. So why 7 and why other languages return different results? It's because Swift characters are grapheme clusters. So this is a very loaded term, but to think about it, it a grapheme cluster is just basically a human perceived character. Yeah. For uh, other languages, they might use a UF, UTF-8 encoding, and then they will count some code points, in, and for C, they will count the number of bytes. So it will give you a different result. Yeah. So let's go into try to decompose the string. Uh, uh, yellow, blue, Jazik Swift. So there are four languages in this text. First is Chinese, is uh, Latin, there's Japanese, and there's Russian. So uh, let's talk about how we can tokenize this thing. So for Chinese tokens, and for Jap uh, there's one character per token, and there are no space between them. For Latin-based languages like English and, uh, uh, and Russian, or Cyrillic in general, they will have multiple char characters per token, and they will are mostly separated by spaces or punctuations. Whereas Japanese token, so this is uh, uh, alphabet called katakana, which uh, says tokenizing, which is a borrowed word from, from English. So actually, this one should ideally be considered one single token. However, for the rest of the tokens, like gasuki desu, it should be uh, either kanji or like uh, hiragana, it should be treated as same to Chinese. So at this point in time, what you might ask me why do we support so many languages, right? So it's just because we are in a very unique region here. We're in Southeast Asia. And we have a lot of different languages around the region. It's not like in US where you can just get away with one single language. So let's talk about how we, we are going to tokenize this thing. So uh, this is uh, just a brief, brief outline. I will go through with you later. But, uh, and this strategy will not work with all languages. It only worked for the languages I just showed you in the previous slide. Yeah. So the first step is to separate potentially single character tokens from the rest. And you can look at this very loaded uh, regular expression. Basically, it will check for all uh, Chinese, Japanese, and Korean characters in the text. And this uh, regular expression is very, very powerful. Uh, basically, it just, yeah, just check all these characters that belong in the Han, the Hiragana, Katakana, or Hangul group inside of the Unicode uh, block. And in each of these tokens will be captured as one, whereas for the rest, we'll trip all diacritics, convert to lowercase or uppercase depending on your preference, and split by whether they are letter. So this is very loaded. Let's go uh, through them one by one. So first one, let's uh, split out all the things that are Chinese or Japanese or Korean. So each one of these will be marked out. And we'll regard each one of them as one token. So that's, that's all good. Uh, for the rest, uh, let's strip all diacritics. So what are diacritics? So if you look at this, it's uh, Vietnamese text, and it is a French text. And you have uh, like those squiggly marks on top or below. Yeah. So basically, stripping all diacritics, meaning removing all of them. Yeah. And the next step is to convert them to lowercase, uppercase. It depends on your preference. Over here, I use 
lowercase. And so uh, finally, we have to split by whether they are letter or not. So why can't we simply split by spaces and punctuation? Why? It's because uh, space and punctuation is too general, right? In different language, they have different spaces and different uh, punctuations. For example, the Japanese space is different from the English space, and the Japanese comma is different from the English comma. But even if we know all the sets of spaces and punctuations, we still shouldn't split by spaces or punctuations. Why? Because of emoji. Yeah. So even if you split by space or punctuations, you'll see the la and the smiley face will be considered as one token. So basically, we have to go through each character and ask them, are you a letter or not? And if you are a letter, I just add you to my token. If you're not, then we'll go. Yeah. And uh, in Apple Standard Library, we have a very powerful function called isLetter. It was just recently introduced, which is very powerful. So even if you ask it for Arabic characters or like Russian characters, it will tell you, yes, it's a character. But for any other things, it will say no. So that's why I really like working with iOS libraries because of that. Um, yeah. So let's talk about how we can bring this tokenizing behavior into FTS5 in SQLite. So SQLite uh, support this thing called custom tokenizer, where we can uh, put in a custom function into SQLite and tell us, hey, don't use your default behavior. Use this one instead. Yeah, and it's, it's actually a C API. So you can see like all the const jar and everything down there. Uh, it's very low level. Uh, here, there's a constructor, destructor, and a tokenizer. You don't have to care about all these things. The most important thing you have to care about is the, the tokenizer function. So if you see over here, I think, I, yeah. So this one is a full text that is passed in into you. And then the, uh, this is the, all the charges, number of characters. And here is the callback function that you're supposed to call in FTS5 to tell them, hey, this is the token. So the callback function takes in a string. We just tell him, OK, this is one token. Uh, this is the length of it. Uh, what is the position in the original string? And what is the end position in the original string? So you just call this function in turns, and then you can tokenize your text by yourself. Um, however, the SQLite C is, uh, is in, uh, the SQLite is in C API. So for Android, you can use JNI. And for Swift and Objective-C, actually, Swift and Objective-C can interface with, call, uh, with C calls natively. So we don't really have a problem. But in, in my app, we actually use this framework, uh, GRDB, which abstract a lot of these things out to a very nice Swift function that we can call. Yeah, so if you ever need to do this thing in your own project, you can look at GRDB. <coughs> and last thing uh, we want to talk about is the uh, sorting of the text type. Because sometimes, uh, actually most of the time, the, the virtual table is of text type, and we cannot sort them fast enough. So what can we do? So in FTS5, we have an extra function, uh, extra feature called the um, external content table. And what it does is that it links your FTS5 virtual table with an ordinary SQL, SQL table. Yeah. And uh, you can he hear that the, uh, you can create two tables together, and then you link them together using triggers. So every time you add one column to the external content table, it will also be indexed inside the FTS5 table. And they are linked together by this unique <coughs> default column called row ID. So this one is not what we create, but it is created for us by default for SQLite. So these two things is how they know that, hey, these two columns are the same. Yeah. So having this external content table, you can finally query for uh, your results. So this is usually what people will do. Uh, they will select from the external content table. It will join on the uh, message table and where the row ID are equal. And we will search for the content where the content match the query. However, this is very, very slow. This is around 0 0.37 uh, 73 seconds for 100,000 matches of the query. That is very slow by, <laughs> by our app standard. Imagine having to stop for one second before you receive your results. So actually, there's a better way of doing this. You have to force the index <coughs> of the table. So here, we're trying to sort all the messages using timestamp. Because I want the latest message to be on top and the uh, very old message to be below. So uh, to force the index, you can just say index by this thing. And it's automatically three times faster. Yeah. So why is this so? In SQLite or in any other SQL language, you have this thing called the, uh, the query plan. 
and it, you can pass in explain query plan followed by your query to ask it, hey, how are you going to perform this query? And it will tell you what are the steps it goes through to perform this query. So if you look at no index forcing the query plan, it will scan the message table first, which is the virtual table. After scanning it, it will try to find everything that have the same uh, row ID, and then it will construct a temporary bin uh, B tree in, in memory to order the string. So it's very, very slow. However, if you force the index, it will sort on the external table first, and then it will do a subquery on the message table, and then it will return out the result. And that's why it's so much faster. In our research, we also do other optimizations, but we found out to be slower than this one, so that's why we didn't do it. Yeah. So yes, that's a lot of information about SQLite. I hope you remember this. If you don't, just, just talk to me sometimes if you want. OK, let's uh, move on to the second section of today, uh, building a custom search engine. And uh, what are the, the, changes, uh, the challenges that we face in, in CTOT that prompt us to build this custom search engine? Was because first thing, uh, all the messages are securely stored on the device only. And all the messages are wiped on our server as, as soon as they are delivered to all the uh, intended recipients. So that's why we can only do all these sort of things in, on the device. And um, a few months ago, there came a new feature called uh, Global Search in CTOK. So uh, what Global Search means is that uh, it matches everything within the app. You can search for messages, you can search for contacts, you can search for groups, for everyone, it matches everything. And the second requirement uh, tells us that we have to highlight all the partial matches. Let's say if I search for V, then only the V will be highlighted, not VU. Yeah, uh, it's actually harder than it sounds. And there are different matching strategies for single and multiple token queries. Like for example, if you type in one single token, like let's say VU, then it will match as a substring. But if you say like ang VU, like two, two tokens, it will only match by prefix. Don't ask me why, ask my project manager. Yeah. So very weird requirements. And down the line there, uh, OK, let's just talk about this first. So basically, if you, OK, it's a little bit small, but here is AN. And for the single token case, it will match substring. And for the multiple token case, it will match uh, only the uh, prefix. Yeah. And OK, let's just skip the details. Let's go. And a very big feature that came out uh, just two months ago, I think, was uh, pinion search. So what is pinion search? Uh, in other C offices, there are colleagues who put their Chinese name only in, in the app. And other colleagues in the same office, they don't speak Chinese. So there's no way they know how to pronounce these people's name. Even they know, like, hey, this guy is blah, 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 but they don't know which Chinese character it is. So one of the features that was requested was that we given a uh, uh, pinyin pattern search for the corresponding Chinese name. As you can see here, my colleague, okay, I, I rename all my colleagues' name to some weird characters, but it is La Chi Chen Sang. And then if you say Chen Sang, it will like fetch out this guy. Yeah, so um, this is one of the requirements. And it, it is not as uh, simple as it looks. But let's explore how we can uh, address this problem, okay? so. In Swift, we have this uh, very cool API called uh, Applying Transform. And basically, uh, it is available in the default uh, library. You can just apply transform Mandarin to Latin, and it will convert this uh, Chinese string to, the, uh, to the, the Latin text. And later on, you can strip the diacritics as well. And then it will turn it into a very intelligible string down here. For Android, you can use this library called uh, Tiny Pinyin. That's what our Android guys in the company is using. Yeah. So uh, switching transformation can work very well for other cases as well. Like you can, like you know, uh, transform other languages as well. Just as a side. And uh, from here on, it will get a little bit technical. So bear with me for a while. So inside our search, we define a, a object called the token. So like I said, each token object will represent a unique token in the original string alongside with all the alternate representations of the token. So what, is, uh, what are the alternate representations? So for example, let's say he, uh, this Swift code, but you can understand it, I hope. Yeah, so I have a struct called token. I have a string, which is the original representation. I have all the uh, alternate, alter, alternate forms of the token. And 
for each of the alternate forms, we match it. This is the dictionary. It matches with a match type. So it can either partially map to a string or wholly match a string. And for example, here I have this big token. And this is uh, English text. So it will partially match another string. For example, big will match bigger and ambiguous. But here, for example, here is a Chinese token. It's called da. So da, it, when you translate it to uh, here, you shouldn't make it a uh, substring uh, search. Yeah, you should, you should only match this token wholly. You shouldn't match it as a substring. Because imagine you type in some Chinese character and it matches some English guy's name. Yeah, so that's why we, we don't do it. Yeah, we, we define it in, in a such uh, behavior. Uh, currently, the way that we do it in our app is very dumb. Uh, it's actually an O time, yeah, O N time, N K time M uh, algorithm. So it, it's a very naive token matching algorithm. So why do I talk about this, right? We are talking about efficient matching right now. So I'll talk more about how we can improve this case later on in the slides. But let's just move on to solve this uh, problem uh, in its entirety first. So the next step with the problem with the current tokenization is that if you write the pinyin without spaces, there's no way we can know like where is to split, you know, where we can split the Chinese characters. For example, last time, uh, I have a friend named uh, Yan Gen, but a lot of people name, uh, call him Yang En because like because if you write it like this, there's no way you know which one you can split. And for the search uh, as well, for example, if this is a query, it cannot split. It doesn't know where to split the token so that it can match up with the text string. So here was one of the biggest problem that we have when we try to build this feature. So uh, what I bring up is this thing called uh, reverse prefix pin matching. So now the text becomes a pattern. We reverse the roles of the uh, two entities we are talking about. So let's say if you are trying to match uh, Chang with this text, then we will turn it around. This one becomes the query, and this one will become the, uh, the text. So all this thing here is just the steps, but I will explain to you one by one. Okay. So let's say this is now our text, and this is our query. We'll turn the first character into uh, the uh, Latin form first, and we found out that the prefix of these two match. So we chop up this one, and rec we recursively match it down to the last character. And when we end up into our base case, which is when the query string is, uh, is empty, then we know that it is a match. Yeah, so this is how we do our reverse prefix pinyin matching. And similar to the previous one, it is very, very inefficient. Because let's say you have 10 text to match. Each text has k Chinese token. And each string matching is om as best. The best you can do is om. Then it's on times m times uh, m times k, which is very, very inefficient. Yeah. So there are a few improvement strategies we have in mind. But as with all software engineering products, I have to ask my manager, I have to ask my product manager whether I have time to do all these things. Like, oh, I'm going to speed this up by, by like, you know, 0 uh, 1.25 times. Will you allow me to do it? It's like, no, we have other more important features. So here are just some suggestions. So first thing is that we build a tree, a try that points uh, each to token to each of the nodes. So every time you fire up the search, we'll do the indexing in the background. Basically, we we'll point. Uh, we we'll make a graph or like a tree, uh, like a tree that points uh, each of the token to the intended matching uh, participant, yeah, like the, the users inside the chat. So here, when you type in the query, you just walk through the tree, the tree, and then it will point to all of the matching candidates. So this is one, but it's very space consuming because the space uh, is exponential. If uh, yeah, on a very large database of username. Yeah. So another strategy is that just to dump all of this into a SQLite database and let the database does its work. So <laughs> yeah, the, um, uh, this is one of the improvement strategies that we had. Uh, there are a few drawbacks to these uh, strategies of doing things, though. So uh, bear in mind that sometimes if you uh, want you want to translate a characters which had different uh, pronunciations, then you cannot do it. So if you put this string into uh, Swift, it will say uh, which is wrong. This thing should be Lao Puchi. Yeah. So that's one of the drawbacks. And another drawback is that it will assume Japanese names as Chinese names. So for example, is my favorite character uh, is uh, Conan, Detective Conan, if you watch. It's uh, Shinichi Kuro. But then in Chinese, it's Kong Teng Xin Yi. Yeah. So it's a, it's a different name. Yeah. 
And also, it was difficult to perform well on Japanese name with, uh, with multiple pronunciation. For example, this one on the left is Yamada, but on the, on the right is Tanaka. So the, the character over there, the window character, can be pronounced as Ta or Ta, depending on where it is in the string. So yeah, the best way is actually do not assume the pronunciation and tell the users to put in their actual uh, like name there or an alternative Latin name into the database if possible. But uh, otherwise, it's a very fun uh, and challenging problem that we come up. So yeah, it can, it can be really fun to do sometimes. All right. So um, with all of this O n times m times k algorithms, uh, why not we try to improve our uh, performance? So performance over here in school, you talk about a lot about like O n and how we can make it like as linear as possible, make it O one as possible. But however, engineering is very different. So engineering, we are more concerned with UX, like how users perceive our search performance. It's not how the search is done actually in the code sometimes. So let's explore a few expectations that user might have when they perform a search operation. So first thing is that users nowadays are spoiled by speed and accuracy of Google. So they will expect the results to be among the top five of the return results very, very fast. And um, sometimes people like to change the query over going to the next page. For example, if you cannot find what you need, you actually want to type in a different query. You actually don't scroll, 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 find your next page. Or maybe I'm just different. And most people will not go beyond page two. So there's a popular saying somewhere that say everything that lives on page two is dead. Yeah, no one goes there. No one goes to page two. So these are a few expectations of search that we have observed. And actually, these are actually good for us because we can return our results early, right? If the users only expect the first top ten, five to 10 results to be the best results, then we can always return them first. And then <coughs> even if other results are required by the users, we can always perform all this thing in the background and report them later as the users scroll down lazily. Yeah, so uh, that is how we can improve on this thing. <coughs> Sorry. Um, let's talk about more aspects of UX of search. So in search, when the user first enters, we need to show something like an initial state for an app like CTalk like us, we have to tell users, OK, what you can search for, right? So we usually show some illustration there that say, hey, these are the things you can uh, look for. And search has to be very responsive, meaning that the moment that you type your query, the users expect your results to return within uh, 0. Point. For us, we, we base our research result on 0. 0.5, 0. 0.5 seconds. Yeah. So. We also have to indicate whether there are more results. Like for example, if there are more results in the bottom, or we are still trying to load for results or empty state. Like if we cannot find anything, we need to show them that we cannot find anything. So I will introduce to you this thing called paginated search state. This is not anything that is specific, but you can implement this in any language. It's just a general idea of how I want to show you guys what we do in our app to improve our search result. So basically, we keep an array of the current results that we have right now. We have a Boolean flag saying whether we have more results. We have a Boolean flag to say whether we are performing a search. Uh, and we have only one function called fetch more results. Yeah. And basically, when you execute this one, whatever your search operation might be, it will try to execute that. <laughs> and <clears throat> wherever there's a result, it will report immediately to the main UI. So basically, instead of walking through all the end entries of the text, you can just walk through until you find the first five entries in the text, and then you can report them onto the main queue. And then you can perform the rest of the search operations in background and report them when you are done with it. Yeah. So these are very, very technical. I guess I shall not go through them. So yeah, that I that's it for today. I hope I didn't go through all these things very, very fast. but. Now it's time for, for Q&A, so if you have any questions, I can address to you right now. So let's go back there. So talking about the um, uh, FTS5, so FTS5 is actually very, very um, 
uh, very efficient already. The problem with this thing is that uh, on top of the search results, we also want to sort them by a certain criteria. In this case, in my messaging app, I want to sort the messages by the timestamp. So because the timestamp is the text, I need to ch turn it into uh, uh, integer somehow. And that's why I need the external table. The, um, uh, the improvement was very simple. Like I only forced the index on, on this thing. Um, but actually, that's a good question because we tried a lot of different strategies. So I can show you another one that, that we have uh, in here. So this is a different slide that I have from my own company search because I've been giving this talk for a lot of times. Uh, but yeah, so in, in here, if you can see that uh, we, when we try to Im improve on all of this thing, right, we don't just poke around in the dark. Uh, we actually look at this thing called the query plan. So you can say uh, you can input into your SQL console explain query plan of all this thing, and it will tell you like how it's going to do your search. And then you try to look at its strategies. Oh, okay, this one is try to scan this table first. It's try to match itself against the other table, and then it construct the temporary B tree. So this one is notorious because when you try to build a B tree or like a sorting tree in memory, it is very very slow. Yeah. So we are trying to eliminate this step. How is we can base itself on the index. So basically, the table already had another index that we had beforehand. So when you try to sort the table using the index first, it will not actually touch the temporary by uh, B tree to build. Yeah. Uh, there is wait. Um, so we actually tried to improve this thing uh, a lot uh, more. J not just. Is this okay? I'm just moving this thing over. Sorry. Let me do. Open this one. Still looking over. Okay, so this is uh, another talk that I gave in my own internal company a long time ago. Uh, and we, we explored another strategy. So, is this, is this thing, not this thing. Sorry. Yeah, this question is taking a bit long. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, we have this thing called the, okay, so this is uh, forcing the index. We have another thing called using, uh, we, we try to prefix the time zone with zero. So we try to cheat it a little bit. You know, all the text, uh, okay, let's, let's try not to use the external table. Let's just append zeros to our timestamp so that now your string sorting uh, is, you know, is, is not integer sorting anymore, you're sorting by in like string. So you compare each of the character and then if the character is less than that, then it will sort. But this one is also very slow. So yeah, we, we, did, we didn't want to do this. Uh, so we explore this new feature in FTS5 called uh, auxiliary function. Basically, it is used to, uh, traditionally it's used to read how well a query fits a certain text. But we can define our custom auxiliary function inside SQL using a C API. And I actually use this thing to, um, to turn it into, to use timestamp. So basically, I will just turn the text into uin32, and then I will just minus in the max, because I want the, uh, the biggest one, the latest message to be on top. So that's why I need to reverse the function. Yeah, and uh, in my initial trials, it is very fast. It's 0 0.04 seconds. Why? It's because there's only one single uh, query plan, which is scan the table. And at first, it seems like a miracle. Like, this is our, actually our first prototype. But however, we realized later on is that our test database is flawed. Because when I generated the test database, I actually generated them batch by batch. Like, when I generated 500,000 messages, I actually only generate uh, all, like 1,000 messages at once. So all of them have the same timestamp. And this becomes a problem because actually each of the timestamp value is only calculated once. So this, by this method, we wrongly accuse this function or wrongly recognize this function as being very fast. But actually, it just has less things to calculate compared to the other methods. But uh, turns out when we create a new test database with strictly increasing timestamp, the forcing index actually works much faster than this one. Yeah, so after our research, we found out that the forcing the index on the table. Uh, but, okay, to come back to the question in general, just look at the query plan. 
if the query plans do is doing something really stupid, you should be improving that part. Yeah. Okay. Any other question? I can speak uh, Vietnamese, I can speak English, uh, I can speak English, I speak a little bit from uh, French, je parle un peu français, and I speak uh, Russian, uh, yeah, eh, that's a lot, yeah, I, I, I can only speak a little bit of Russian. I can speak uh, Japanese, I can speak Chinese, I can speak Chinese, I don't know which one, but people, yeah, so I don't know, I, I cannot count. Actually, it's a good thing because when it comes to all these languages, uh, I need to know how they, uh, they are indexed, right? So in our company, we actually have Thai customer as well, and no one in our office is Thai. We don't know whether our search on the Thai language is correct or not, but so far, we have not heard complaints from Thai people. So I think it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just nice we have a new Indian guy, and then we also have a Pakistani guy who ha like happens to know Greek. So we, <laughs> yeah. So basically, uh, currently our search algorithm can work on most of these languages okay. Yeah. Yes? Yes, so uh, sometimes uh, we will ignore the accent. Uh, but when it comes to that, uh, it depends on the user expectation of the search as well. Yeah. So in this particular region, uh, the language that we deal with, we try to strip out the diacritics. But in some other language, when you strip the diacritics, it actually means a very different thing than it is intended to be. So uh, in Ctalk, our app, we actually strip out everything so it can return wrong results for, for that matter. Yeah, but uh, I think it it's really depends on your user base. Because if you want to support a lot of different languages, for example, you are building an app in the Europe, for example, and you want to support all those European languages, then you might need a lot of different edge cases to deal with. Over here, just nice in this particular region, we found like a set of minimal algorithms to process this text such that we can search them correctly. Yeah. So I I say it's a case by case basis. Yes. So this is more like a um, uh, engineering term, uh, actually, because uh, this is a, a protocol. So whatever you're trying to do, you just confirm this protocol. How you return the result is up to you. So <coughs> in this paginated search state, OK, sorry, I need to show this slide on the other side. <coughs> yeah, in this particular um, search state, we we only care about the, the current state of the search. Whether how you uh, arrive at this search is totally based on you. Yeah, so it, it doesn't talk about the accuracy of the search, actually. This one just tell you that if you have a very accurate search algorithms, you can just make use of this framework so that when you first found your first five results, you can just return them immediately, and then you can try to search more for more, for more, yeah. I didn't go through this part very, uh, in details because to go through this thing might take quite a long time. Yeah, if you want to know more about this thing, you can talk to me after the talk. Yeah, I hope that answered your question. All right, any more question? No? So, okay, so uh, thank you very much for coming today. <laughs> yeah. By the way, just a shameless plug, C is always hiring for interns or whatever. So just come out to me if you want. We need more of you. Yeah. My team is entirely NUS, by the way. So don't be afraid. <laughs> what?